having me. I'm, I look forward to talking to everybody. So I am a breast surgeon in New Jersey. I'm very biased. I think breast is the best, hence my title, and breast surgery is the best field there is. Oh, there it goes. So today I'm just going to go over a little bit of background about myself, how I got to where I am. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about surgery and then focusing a little bit about breast surgery and then just some advice for people who want to go into the medical field. So here's my webpage. I am board certified in general surgery, which means I took my written exam and then I passed an oral exam. After that, I did a one-year fellowship with a special training in just breast, learning about the other aspects of breast, not just the surgical aspect, but learning about the medical aspect, the radiation aspect, the genetic counseling aspect, and everything. So now all I do is treat and care for patients about their breast problems, both benign and malignant. <laughs> So this is me. I was like you guys before, a little bit younger. I wanted to be a doctor. I really enjoyed sciences and I really enjoyed learning about why things happen and, and the reason for it. So I chose something in the science field. And here's a picture of me during one of my days during rounds. My mom wanted to see a picture of me in my white coat. I look relatively happy there. Um, the hours are rough for a general surgery residency, but it's not undoable. It's much, much easier than it was many years ago. Many years ago, they used to call them residents because they lived at hospitals and they were residents of the hospitals and never left. But now, luckily, we have work hour restrictions. So at most, we're supposed to only work 80 to 90 hours a week on average, but it's doable. People have lives and it's only for five years. So I went to a regular public school in New Jersey. I didn't go to any fancy boarding schools or private schools. Um, I just took the regular classes that they had in my school. I took some AP classes. I got some credits. I ended up going to Villanova University, which is in Villanova, Pennsylvania. I just majored in one major. I just did biology and I had an honors concentration. During my time at Villanova, I um, somehow ended up on the rowing team, and here is a picture of me. I never rowed before in my life. I went to one of their meetings. I wanted to be a rower, but since I was really skinny, I got recruited to becoming a coxswain. And I never thought that my lessons that I learned as a coxswain will actually help me a lot in my surgical training. Um, after that, I went to graduate school while I was getting my application ready for medical school. So there was a program in my state that allowed me to take medical school classes, which was the ma Masters of Biomedical Sciences. And also I got a Masters of Public Health and a focus uh, in biostatistics. That really helped me reinforce what I wanted to know and it made me experience what medical school classes were like to see if I could handle it. And in addition, it let me have a bigger picture about medicine. So as doctors, we take care of patients just one on one, it's individualized. But public health, we look at the whole entire population. Some important public health initiatives that have been implemented in these in many years include like seatbelts, airbags, and vaccinations. So I thought that this would really make be an asset for me when I became a physician. And actually getting that master's in public health really helped me with my statistics. I'm able to understand all these research papers that I'm reading and criticize them, and uh, not criticize, critique them. And then it also helps me with my paper writing skills because there's a lot of statistics in writing papers. So right after that, I went to UMDNJ, New Jersey Medical School, and now it's called Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. It is one of the public schools in New Jersey, and it's in Newark, New Jersey, not one of the most safest areas, but it was really great in training. We got to see a huge, diverse population. We had patients come off from the from the plane. So we got to see rare diseases like malaria in the US. We also got to treat celebrities because when they got sick at the airport, they would have to come to our hospital. So we got to see the whole spectrum. And I really, really enjoyed my time at New Jersey Medical School. I made some best friends. Um, and these are all my friends that I'm still in contact with every day. 
I am a breast surgeon. He's in uh, physical medicine and rehab. She's an outpatient pediatrician. She's also an outpatient pediatrician. She's a gastroenterologist and she's an inpatient pediatric hospitalist. So after my four years of medical school, I went to Long Island to Nassau University Medical Center. It's a community hospital with a level one trauma center. So we take care of all the big major injuries that happen in Long Island. And there's a lot of major highways that go through that area. So we, got, we were plenty busy. And here is a picture of me with the nurses, my other residents, my attendings, some significant others, my program coordinator. And this is a picture of us during one of our end of the year graduation parties. Five years was not very easy, but it went by a lot faster than I thought it would be. After five years of general surgery residency, you can choose to either go into general surgery and just practice general surgery, which includes hernias, gallbladders, appendixes. There's plenty of things to do as a general surgeon. But if you want to further subspecialize, you, there are many options that you can go to as a general surgeon. So you can go into surgical oncology, which is about two years, which means you can treat the cancers of the colon and the pancreas and the gallbladder. Or you can go into breast, which is what I chose for an additional year. Some people like to operate in the chest and the thoracic cavity and the cardiothoracic cavity. So that can be an additional two to three years of training after your five to seven years of general surgery training. You can go into colorectal where you just focus on the colon and the rectal area, taking care of patients with IBD, Crohn's disease, and like ulcerative colitis and all the complicated rectal problems that patients have. Some patients, um, some people go into trauma and critical care. It can be a one-year fellowship or it can be a two-year fellowship. Some people go into plastic surgery, even though now there are combined direct plastic surgeries, but that's another route that you can do is five to seven years of general surgery and then go into plastic and reconstructive surgery. That's another three years. And after that, you can do an additional fellowship if you want in microsurgery or hand surgery or craniofacial or aesthetics. Um, if you want to go into pediatric surgery, those people tend to end up doing seven years of general surgery because they do two years of research and on top of the five years of general surgery residency. And then you do an additional one to two years focusing on pathology dealing with kids. Some people go into endocrine surgery where you focus on the pancreas. Okay, guys, hang tight really quick. Surgery, but do them through little ports. You can also go directly to hand from general surgery, but it's a little harder. People who go into hand usually are coming from plastics or from orthopedics, but it is something that you can do coming from general surgery. Another option you can go to is vascular surgery. That usually is another two years, and that's when you deal with um, both the arteries and the veins throughout the entire body. So there are a lot of options that you can do after general surgery, or you can just still do general surgery. So these are some of the things that I personally saw during my five years in Long Island. So this is a real patient that we saw in one of our clinics. She is a 20 something year old female that had this horn growing from the top of her head and it's been getting bigger and bigger. We saw her a few years ago, but then she got pregnant and didn't want surgery. And now she returned back to us in general surgery clinic. So we referred her to our plastic surgery colleagues and then they removed it for her. This is a cutaneous horn. There's only about four papers or four episodes of these that are seen worldwide. And we got to see one in Nassau County, Long Island. This is another patient of ours. She was fighting with her grandson. And then um, this knife, uh, this fork, actually, it was a fork. And this is these are her clothing. Um, she got stabbed by her grandson. This is one of our trauma patients that we see. This is another patient of mine that I saw at one of our smaller hospitals. This is a 18 year old child that was playing with the, one of those carbon dioxide race cars. And then he fell on one of the cartridges. 
So the ER often will call us for any foreign objects that need to be removed. And here's just a plain film of the object in the rectum. We made him comfortable and then we were able to remove it gently at the bedside for him. Here is another foreign object that we were, counts, uh, we were consulted on by the emergency room. This is a soy sauce bottle, but you can't tell because you can't x-ray the labels. But this is a view from the forward to backwards, and this is a lateral view from the side of an object that was, again, um, found in somebody's rectum. This one, we had to take the patient to the operating room, make an incision through the belly, and then make an incision through the rectum to remove the object, and then we had to suture him back up. Here is another consult that we got from the psych floor. So sometimes there are patients that have disorders where they will eat whatever they find. So we were consulted for this. These are some rocks that he swallowed. This is a lighter and this is a screw and here is a bolt and here's another rock. So we were monitoring him to see how these objects were passing through his small intestines and we were measuring the diameter of the intestines to make sure that there was no obstruction. We followed him, um, we didn't allow him to eat, and then we followed him with serial abdominal exams to make sure nothing perforated. And then um, eventually he passed everything. This is a picture of a kidney that I took out of a patient. And this is a picture of my hand afterwards. So even though Urology is a special is a separate surgery. Sometimes we get called in general surgery to help um, our colleagues in removing masses. And this was one where the mass on the kidney was adherent to the colon. So they had called us in. So together, us with the urologist, we removed this kidney mass, the kidney from a patient. And um, that's the size of it. Sometimes in um, traumas, patients' hearts will stop and they will need CPR. There are some indications for something called an ED thoracotomy, which is an opening of the chest in the emergency room. If somebody loses their blood pressure or their heartbeat within a few minutes of a trauma, it's an indication to open their chest and to do open cardiac massage and clamping of the aorta. This is a picture of me walking one of my juniors through an ED thoracotomy where we opened the chest up, clamped the aorta, and then started doing open cardiac massage. If you can see here, this is the clamp that we put back there. And these are the retractors to open the ribs, but they fell in this picture. And here is somebody from the other side helping. Um, in surgery, we also cover pediatrics. So in some children that are born from um, women that are younger and their first child, they can have something where their intestines are born outside of their belly. When that happens, we'll usually have a C-section, the patient will be delivered and then they are brought to the ICU and then surgery, we are consulted. So this baby had all his intestines born outside of the belly. It never went in and the umbilical um, area never closed. So we immediately put a silo, which is just a clear bag over the intestines. And every day we would come and wrap it tighter and tighter. Do you see these little white marks right here? And every day we remove it tighter and tighter and we were able to get the intestines back. It takes about a week and then after we can get all the intestines back in the belly, we take the patient to the operating room and we surgically repair the abdomen. So if you do not like seeing disgusting things, just turn away for a couple minutes. This is one of the trauma patients that we got. He is a truck driver who happened to be under the influence of some medications and drugs and got into a really, really bad car accident. So this is one of the images of one of the extremities that we had to take care of. Unfortunately, when we took care of him, um, you can see his bone and his muscle, everything is gone and he did not have any pulses and it was too mangled. The patient ended up needing an amputation right here and we were not able to salvage his leg. 
So those were just some of the pictures of some of my experiences while I did general surgery in Long Island, five years. And those were all my patients' pictures and all the patients that we saw. After that, I went to New York City where I did a one-year breast surgical oncology fellow. Here I am with a picture of my co-fellow. She's actually practicing in um, McAllen, Texas right now. And she is the head of breast down there and is creating a breast program there. And this is our fellowship director, Dr. Susan Bobel. She is one of the leaders and innovators of breast surgery. So this is a picture of us last year in Austin, uh, was it? No, it was in Dallas, Texas, where we had our national breast surgery meeting. So as a breast surgeon, I treat both benign and malignant disease of the breasts. So some benign pathology include breast cysts, breast pain, any benign breast masses known as fibroadenomas. Um, this is a needle of going into one of the breast cysts that I was aspirating. I had got it to work, but I can't get the video to play anymore. I'm sorry. So that is something that I do and I do it under ultrasound guidance. And here is a picture of me removing a breast mass from somebody's breast. As you can see, this one is about 13 centimeters. And this one was completely benign on pathology, on biopsy, but we took it out because it was rapidly growing. I do have another picture that um, if you do not like seeing things that are, can be a little disgusting, look away for another few minutes. So sometimes in the hospital, we are called to get help get a diagnosis. So this is a young woman well, she's in her 40s who's had this breast mass on her breast and has been ignoring it for many, many years. And she fell and broke her hip. So she was in the hospital for that, but we were called for the breast mass. And this is a large fungating mass on her breasts. And this is her head and this is her left arm. This obviously is cancer. So we were called to take a biopsy of it. So my average week as a breast surgeon, I have office hours twice a week where I see new patients, I see follow-ups and I do ultrasound procedures. I do biopsies and cyst aspirations and small breast procedures in the, in the office if you have a small cyst that needs to be removed or a small mass in your breast. So I do this about two days a week. And then the other two days of the week, I am in the operating room. I perform mastectomies, which are removal of the entire breast, or I do something called partial mastectomies, also known as lumpectomies, where I take a small area of the breast. Those are the two major surgeries that I perform. And then I have one day where I catch up on paperwork, catch up on imaging and charting with patients. This is a picture of all the fellows from my year. This was taken two years ago. And um, I am in contact with a lot of these people and a lot of them are very happy. We all think breast is the best field. And our fellowship is really nice in that we are usually one or two fellows at each hospital. There are four at MD Anderson and four at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but most programs have one or two fellows. So every year there are a couple events where we all gather together and have workshops. This was a workshop that we had at Houston where we had cadaver labs. And then we got to meet with other surgeons and you know, just do things that we might have missed in our training. So how did I do this? How did I know? Um, I knew I always wanted to go into medicine as a kid because I enjoy sciences and I like knowing why something happens and having a reason for it. Before I started medical school, I wanted to be a pediatrician. That was my goal with my best friend. And we both wanted to be pediatricians. And ironically, we are both breast surgeons right now. We really like kids. We want to give out cool lollipops and cool stickers. But then when we did our pediatric rotation, we just really didn't like seeing kids sick and dealing with annoying parents. Sometimes sick kids are sick and I, we just feel completely helpless saying, you don't deserve this. You didn't do anything wrong. And it really broke um, my heart. So that's why I did not choose pediatrics, even though I love kids. Um, during my first year of medical school, after I knew I didn't want to do pediatrics, I thought I wanted to do anesthesia. 
My medical school is really special. There was a scholarship that was offered through the American uh, Anesthesia S Association. So between my first and second year, I got money to do research with anesthesia. And during that time, I was also able to go to the operating room on behalf of anesthesia to help collect specimens. And I absolutely loved it. Most places, they won't let med students go into the operating room until third year. So for as a first and second year medical student, going to the operating room is amazing for us. So we really loved it. So I love being in the operating room. So that's why I thought I wanted to do anesthesia. Then comes third year when I did my surgery rotation and I realized, oh, if I do surgery, then I don't have to constantly be looking over the curtain. So in the operating room, there's a, usually a curtain, one side for surgery and then one side for anesthesia. As a junior, the only way I could see surgery was going by going and following the anesthesiologist. But I realized if I did surgery, I would never have to peek over the curtain and I got to be where all the action was. As a woman, a lot of people discourage me from going into general surgery. They're saying, you can't have a life. It's really rough. They're going to be sexist against you. And a lot of people strongly discourage me to go through it. However, um, on my third year and fourth year, I did three months of surgery sub-internship where I pretended to be an intern for three, three months. And my decision was, if I could survive those three months and be happy, I was going to apply for surgery. And if I couldn't handle it or if anything was upset, upsetting me, I was going to apply to anesthesia or emergency medicine, something with procedures because that's what I like to do. After those three months, they were grueling. I was tired, but I was still happy. And during that time, I went to my family and I asked them what I should do. And they said, just pick whatever is happier for you because, you know, residency is only a finite amount of time. The rest of your life is much longer. And because of that, I chose to go into general surgery. And it's probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. And after that, um, in my hospital, we are a community hospital, a safety net hospital. So we have a grant from the county where we can give out free mammograms and do free breast care. So I really enjoyed breast because we had a breast clinic every single week. We got to take care of the patients that didn't have enough money. And we had continuity with them, you know, once they got an abnormal screening, then we had a biopsy finding it's abnormal, then we took them to surgery. And then we followed them afterwards, one year, two year, three years, five years after they've been diagnosed and how they've survived. I like that aspect of breast where you can have continuity of care and see them for a long time. That doesn't really exist for a lot of general surgery stuff. Like after somebody has appendicitis, you take that appendix and you probably never see them again, or you take out their gallbladder and you know you don't see them afterwards. So I really enjoyed that aspect of breasts. And also in breasts, it's not just me. I'm just one person who helps treat the patient. It's multidisciplinary. We have a medical oncologist who administers the chemotherapy and the pills that the patient needs. We have a radiation oncologist who helps with the radiation. We have a genetic counselor. We have physical therapists. There's a lot of people who are involved in taking care of a breast cancer patient. And I really enjoy that aspect. And there's so much going on with breasts right now. Every day it's constantly changing. Things are getting better. Back then there was a Halstead mastectomy. Patients were deformed after they got diagnosed with breast cancer. But now patients go in for surgery, come out looking basically the same or even better. And um, people don't have to be deformed. And I love that. And people are living with breast cancer. So just some advice for you guys who all want to be doctors or future colleagues. Do what you're doing right now. I know it's hard to shadow, but I think you guys are doing a great job by coming here and participating. Um, continue to do that because you want to know if you really want to do it. It's a, it's a long and um, rough path, but if you, you have to want it. If you don't want it, you're going to be miserable. It's only happy if you want it. Take all your pre-med courses that you need get your bio, get your chems, get them out of the way, um, take your MCATs, um, try to do well on them. So usually they will look at your GPA from your college and your MCAT score and they'll convert them to two different scales and then do that. They'll add it together for a score for you and then they'll add and subtract based upon that, based upon your extracurriculars and any if there's any red flags to your application. That's usually how they look at you from medical schools.
try to participate in extracurriculars. Um, we don't want boring people in medicine. We want a diverse population. Also be persistent, keep on trying. There are people who didn't get in the first time who try again, it's okay. Um, we really want you to want it because it's not easy. And also be professional. You can reach out to other doctors, but don't be rude to people. We don't like rude and mean people in our field. Here is a picture from, I guess, maybe two years ago. This is, we're all doctors as well. We went on for a bachelorette trip. She's the GI doctor. She's the pediatrician. She's a pain medicine doctor. She's a anesthesia, regional anesthesia and anesthesia doctor. And here we all are, you know, we work really hard, but we have fun too. You can have a life. And I think that's it. I want to say good luck to everybody. I think you guys made a great decision. Please let me know how I can help and good luck with everything. Thank you so much. This was, <laughs> and it was like a 30 minute, just fast forward into surgery. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, people really loved all those pictures. <laughs> well, surgery great. is the best cert. They're, I'd even steal them from anybody. They're from when I was in Long Island. You can, you see crazy things as a surgeon. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and there were a lot of questions, so okay. we'll try to get through some. Um, I think right now when you were talking about like extracurriculars and just doing, putting your best foot forward, what kind of extracurriculars did you do or would you recommend that students try to get involved with? Well, um, I did sports in college, which um, people always like because it shows teamwork. And it also shows leadership that you can work well together. And it also shows dedication because any sport you do, you have to go there every day and you have to be committed and you have to go to the game. So that really shows a lot about your character. So I think the even you know, sports are good. Any clubs, any leadership is good. I also volunteered at the hospital. I wanted to make sure I really wanted to be a doctor, not just so you know what you see on TV. So I volunteered in sterile supply. So everything you do in the operating room ends up getting cleaned by this company downstairs in the basement. So I volunteered with them. I helped them clean and prep everything and got to play with all the instruments. <laughs> so I thought that was fun. And I also pushed patients around the hospital. Great, and, thank you. So it's kind of like, would you just say things that you're interested in, try to find yeah. some kind of- just anything, We just want to show people who are real, who are dedicated and good people. It doesn't have to be like, you have to do whatever. Just do whatever you want. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. Then try to find something else that you like. They, we just want people who are well-rounded and nice and colleagues, because we're all going to be colleagues. I'm going to be calling you for a consult. I don't want you to be a mean person who's not well-rounded. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that advice. It's always nice to hear that. You can kind of really tailor your experience to yourself. Yeah, yeah. they um, just want to see that you're normal. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of questions about research. And so I think some people wanted to know, like, did you do research while in medical school? And then also, once you're in residency and practicing, is there still a possibility to do research if that's what you're interested in? You can do research whenever you want. Um, I did research as a medical student. Um, I was part of the anesthesia researching grant, so I had to do research with that. I did a poster, and then I ended up getting a paper. Um, you do as much as you want. You have to get make sure you take the city certificate to show that you won't abuse. You won't like do studying on like pregnant women and people who are prisoners. You have to do that certification. Find somebody who is involved in research and get involved with them. You can always do a data research. Um, my program has a research coordinator and a research resident, so you have the option of taking a year off to do the research year if you want to, but it was mandatory that everybody was part of research, so it was very easy to do research, but you had to do it on the side by yourself. And right now, I am in private practice, and we still have research, so my group has a research coordinator as well, and she helps us with our IRBs to get them approved and to help us submit papers to get them published as well. There's always an opportunity for research. You just have to reach out to somebody and just be willing to put in the grunt work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we had some questions um, asking about um, just your experiences as a woman in medicine and um, as a person of color in medicine as well. So um, in the beginning, I had another girl in my class. Um, a lot of the older male attendings try to get us to cry during rounds all the time. 
And it was basically, they're like, oh, we just want to, he just wanted to see what he could do. And he never really got to us. And we just fought back harder and harder, showing him that we could do, we made sure we were prepared about our patients. We read up and we just were stronger. And in the end, after our five years, he thought we were probably some of the best residents because we could handle that intimidation and we worked harder. And in fact, he would only operate with us because he's like, I only trust these people. So when people like look down to you, you just like, I'm better and I can do it. Don't be intimidated. They just, they're playing a game. But there's more and more women and more and more people of color in medicine and in surgery. Yeah, absolutely. So everyone just keep going, keep grinding. Oh. Um, Yasmin's muted again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry about, and that's my dog. Um, how much shadowing you had gotten done um, during undergrad and, you know, where you found like the best shadowing? How I did a lot of shadowing in high school with a family friend um, who allowed, he's a cardiologist who allowed me to see him do a cardiac cath and see some office hours. And then um, I did some shadowing in medical school to see, do I really want this? It's a, it's a tough path. So I just wanted to be a hundred percent sure before I dedicate my twenties to this pursuit of being a doctor. Uh, it's really hard now with COVID and they're not even letting medical students go in. So I, I feel bad for you guys, but just keep on doing what you're doing. I think it's great. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, we're all trying to find any kind of virtual stuff that we can, even though that's getting harder and harder. Um, there were some questions about your breast fellowship. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, someone asked, are breast fellowships typically made for females? And I guess like the bigger question is, um, what percentage like do you think is the males versus females that go into breast um, fellowship? So right now in my practice, we have six breast surgeons, two are male, four are female. So, but in my fellowship class, I think there might have been five men out of 80 I think it's more and more female, but um, one of my best friends is also a breast surgeon. He's he's male and he loves it. Okay, that's good to know because I think there were some uh, males in the chat that were interested, but they weren't really sure if that's- No, you can do it, you can do it. That's like, if there's a lot of males or if it's kind of, I don't know, like looked down upon. So that's good to no, know. No. So, so the other surgeons kind of looked down, your brother is a colorectal. They, they're like, they kind of like, well, why are you doing breasts? Like a lot of my attendees like, why are you doing breast? You're so good. You know, why don't you do real surgery? I'm like, I am doing real surgery. I'm curing cancer and I'm making them look good afterwards. That's how I feel. Yeah, that's true. Just, you know what you're good at, stick with it. We, we think you're doing real surgery. So thank you for your contributions. Um, there was some questions asking about, I mean, when you were showing those pictures, people were asking, how do you deal with those kinds of um, traumatic images? Is that something that you kind of went in knowing you would see, or is it something that you just learn over time and learn how to deal with? Oh, um, I don't know how to answer that. Well, I also went to medical school in Newark, so we saw all that kind of, so I, I was kind of used to it. And I remember I like surgery, so I, I like this stuff. So it doesn't really gross me out, but I, I, bones do gross me out. And my husband is an orthopedic surgeon. So there are things that, that make me wheezy that I try to avoid, but you just figure out what, what's good for you, what's not good for you. If you don't like seeing that, you can go into internal medicine or you can go into pathology where everything's already, you know, no blood for you. The blood's already gone. You can find, or you can do radiology where you can look at the imaging. You don't have to do all, you don't have to see all those things if you don't want to. But somebody in emergency medicine and in surgery will most definitely see those. We, I have other ones that my friends did that I don't, where we had somebody who was run over by a train and then they came in in two pieces. We have patients who were impaled by large objects, all at my hospital. They weren't my patients, so I didn't show them. So we have a lot more, more gruesome pictures that you see all the time. Yeah, that's true. More because they don't want to see all that stuff. You were muted again. Why is this happening to me? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, I was saying that we definitely had some um, doctors tell us that they 
uh, chose internal medicine because they didn't want to see that growth stuff. So it's definitely yeah good to or we a way to get out of it feel. if you're not interested in that. Yeah. Um, we also had someone ask us uh, a couple times if you work with uh, nurse practitioners or PAs. So regularly. I work with PAs regularly. Nurse practitioners t- t- tend to work with internal medicine people. Um, PAs are, um, they do the same as NPs during the office hours, but PAs have privileges where they can go into the operating room and help us and give us a hand. So yes, I do work with a PA. Great. Thank you so much. Um, um, you kind of talked to us about work-life balance um, before session, but there are a lot of people kind of asking about how it is and um, if it's all crazy, just like crazy. Well, um, not. it's not. Right now in surgery, it's much more of a work-life balance. Um, they uh, Trauma surgery, which everybody thinks is like very, very busy, probably what you see in Grey's and Eyes. They do more like shift work. So it's more like the ER where you do 24 hours on, 24 hours off. And if there's nothing that happens, you just sleep for the 24 hours. There's a much emphasis on work-life balance. Um, and if it also depends on money. Do you want more money? So I could take ER call where I get called in the middle of the night for anything, but it's more money, but it's also uh, I lose sleep. So you depends on what you want. You can do, you can make more money, but you have to sacrifice time. So it all depends on what you want. For me, you know, just getting a regular six digit salary is enough for me. And I'd rather just spend my time with my family members. That's worth more to me. Maybe I'll change my mind and pick up a bunch of ER calls, but I don't. But most life, most of them have work-life balance and a lot of specialties try to have that work-life balance, especially in general surgery. I can't speak for neurosurgery or orthopedics or OBGYN, but for general surgery, we try to have a work-life balance. It's always good to hear that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> there is. And you just have to like get through the residency part and then it's so much better at the other end. Um, so going back to your education, you mentioned that you did your master's in um, MPH. And so there was a lot of people wondering, you know, they're kind of debating on whether or not to take a gap year and why particularly you chose to pursue an MPH and if it's helped you at all in your um, current life. Yes, I've always wanted an MPH. I knew that with the medicine. So I could either, they have five-year programs where you can take a year off in the middle of medical school to get it. And since I had some time before, and then um, my program offered two of them together. So my core for one counted as electives toward the other. So I was basically able to get both degrees for the time of one one degree. So that's why I got both. I want to make sure, A, I can handle medical school, and this is what I really wanted to do, and B, I um, I wanted the MPH. I definitely thought the MPH helped. It changes the way I think about things, especially global health, and um, having a master's in statistics is priceless because I'm able to help with the analysis of data for research and to be able to interpret everything and run and crunch numbers. Yeah, that's great. I think there was um, was a bunch of people in the chat that were either applying or have our, our in MPH. So they're really happy to hear that. It oh, yeah. will be helpful. Yeah. And it looks good on your resume when you're applying for medical school. Yeah. That's great to know. There was also a lot of um, attending attendees wondering about DO versus MDs in surgery. And um, I mean, you're an MD, but did you have many DO co-residents or what um, trend do you see DOs in surgery going? I think for a DO to get into surgery is a lot harder than an MD to get into surgery because there are not that many DO surgery spots. So the the DOs that I do see in surgery are brilliant because they have to be cream of the crop to get in there. And they tend to work a lot harder. And um, the DOs uh, also know OMM, which are, it's helpful for like specialties like PM&R and orthopedics. Um, I think most DOs end up going to primary care because that's their training of thought, but a lot of them do go into neurosurgery, urology. I know DOs in all the specialties, but it's, I think they tend to be smarter because there aren't as many spots, but now they combine the spots. And then for fellowships, some programs do not accept DOs because of the way their grants are run. I didn't know that until I was on the board. Oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that either. 
we have um, to, we can only accept one GO because our funding has to, one has to be an MD. I'm like, oh, okay. But there is yeah, I guess. the US. Yeah, that's great. Um, at least there's a stigma that's breaking. Um, um, kind of going off of that, we did have some questions kind of asking if just about like the balance of just, um, and pressure of just like the financial burden of uh, going to med school and then residency and, you know, all that. It's kind of notorious that we all have a lot of debt. Um, and if you have just any advice for like, well, I think it. it's worth it, but you should also be smart. You shouldn't max out all your loans so you can go get fancy. You don't need a Starbucks every day. You can save money and do that because remember, you have to pay everything back. So you can live a modest lifestyle. Um, I'm an attending now for a couple, for two years, but I still live how I was as a resident. Um, we work so much and we got all our meals for free at the hospital. So I didn't end up spending that much money because A, I didn't have time to spend that much money and B, I got all my food from the hospital. So you can do it. Just try not to rack up your debt too much. You don't need that Mercedes to go to work. You know, a Toyota is fine. That, no, and there's no shame. One of my colleagues is one of the highest making plastic surgeons in my group. And he drives around a Toyota that my PA makes fun of that is put together with a string because his bumper fell off. But you know what? It works and nobody cares. So you can do it. You just, just don't use that, like, don't be extravagant. You don't need the newest iPhone every single time. Didn't they say Tom Brady has an iPhone 6 or something? And somebody was making fun of him? I think so. Right? I think you're right about that. So you, you, you can do it. And, like, you're very, you can always find a sale. Yeah, that's true. I definitely heard about that. Um, you know, people with old money usually live a more modest life yeah. because you don't need yeah. to show off. Okay, let's see. These questions got buried because they loved all of your analogies. <laughs> oh, come on. We're um, oh, gosh, really some questions buried. asking um, about <laughs> how you personally manage to like stay healthy yourself and were there times like did you find time to work out or kind of like your mental health and how you um, went through that through residency? So when I was a resident my first two years, they didn't have any resident well-being. They didn't have um, a lot of these things that they have now. Um, when I was a four and five, we have resident retreats. We have mandatory breaks. We had mandatory protected time. And it made the mental health a lot better. And our program director was more involved in asking us about mental health, which helped. I think it's awareness and it's also the ACGME that is helping with the mental health in exercise. And I also, my hospital was next to a park, so I used to go run post-call. Do you think that um, kind of the stigma around surgery, that it's really, um, that it's a rough residency and they don't really care about you, do you think that that will change in the future and will start to get better? Um, or what kind of changing. trends do you see? I think it is changing because there's more people that are getting into med, uh, surgery and the more juniors are getting more senior in the administration. So it is changing, but it has to come from top down and it, it just takes a while, but it is happening. Our residencies are rough compared to like pediatrics and medicine and whatnot, but it's nowhere as bad as when it was 20, 40 years ago when they got one day off a month. But you need all that time so you can get all the experience. I understand why. Because they keep on having these work hour restrictions, a lot more people are going to fellowship because they don't feel like they're adequately trained. You need the five years and you need to see all the bad things and all the complications so you know how to manage it later on. If they cut it short, then you need to find your training just gets extended anyway. So. Right. Um, that's definitely true um kind of going off of that um there's someone that very much wants to know um what just like the typical day in life of residency was like so for my you. program had call so ours were 6 a.m morning was rounds so whoever was on call had to get everything ready by 6 a.m so we could round as a team at 6 a.m um, the notes would be written by the intern. And then after we rounded, it would probably take half an hour to 45 minutes. We go to the OR board. You're pre-assigned the cases the night before. 
and we start operating at seven o'clock and then you operate until about five o'clock. And then in that time in the middle, you start, you see consults in the ER and consults on the floor and you manage between the cases. So as the more senior you are, the more time you are in the operating room and you get to choose the cases. The more junior you are, the more you're handling floor stuff and um, running things back and forth with the junior, the attending and the senior and stuff like that. But it's, it's probably 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. It wasn't too terrible. We got used to it. And then you would take call every third day. But after you take call, you get to leave the next day, which they didn't do in the past. Yeah, that's really interesting. We always kind of just assumed that it's like a much crazier schedule, like way into the middle of the night. So that's great to hear. Um, we had a question that was asking about um, telehealth. Um, so because you're in surgery, have you been able to utilize telehealth during COVID or um, has it really not been that helpful? So um, I am using telehealth. Um, some patients, I, some of my post-op patients I operate on have COVID. So during our post-op visit, we did telehealth and they showed me a picture of their incision. And if it looked okay and they were okay with it, that was fine. Um, we also sometimes will do consultations face-to-face, -face, I mean, on telehealth, and I'll have a picture of their imaging as well. So I'm able to do something like that. But if it's a procedure that needs to be done, I have to do it in person. We get everybody COVID tested before and we wear N95s and everything like that. Um, there were some questions asking about, so like you do um, breast oncology cases. And so how often do you collaborate with other oncology specialties? So if there's like metastasis. Um, oh, wait. Every, every breast patient, cancer patient goes to the medical oncologist regardless if they need it. Okay, so that's kind of like a day-to-day -day thing. You're working with other specialties all the time. And, yeah. Okay. I have their numbers. We're texting each other. We refer each other patients. We have a tumor board every week that I go to and we discuss all the cases and we just say, oh, yes, we agree or no, we don't. Or if something is abnormal, we'll discuss it together, all the specialties together every week. Okay, that's really good to know. There was also some questions asking about um, the tools that you use in surgery. So did you, did you do a lot of robotic um, cases in residency and do you use those in your practice today? I did not do a lot of robotic cases in my residency. Um, and I do, there's the robotic mastectomy is not FDA approved in the US, so I haven't done it. The robot is really good for the pelvis. And um, so it's good for urology and GYN. They do do the robot for general surgery for gallbladders and hernias. However, I feel doing it laparoscopically is just faster for me than to do it robot. Thank you for that. Um, we also had a question um, that it seems like a lot of people wanted to hear a little bit more about, about the, um, for the application process, the merging of the DPA and MCAT scores and kind of how that works. So I think I, it's the first time some people heard it. Oh, so every medical school does it differently. I happen to just know a little bit about my medical school. So back then our score was 45. So say you got a 30, so they would make that a three score and the GPA is 4.0. So if you have like a 3.5 GPA, so you have a 3.5 and a 30, they would do, it would be a three and a 3.5 score so that you would get a seven point, a 6.5. And then you would add and subtract according to if you have extracurriculars or whatever. That's, that was how they did it. But th that's way back then. I'm older. Yeah, thank you so much for kind of explaining that a little bit more. Um, also, everyone just remember that our skills are different now. Okay, so your skills are we don't know exactly. Different. So I'm sure they have a <laughs> scale that they do. And they do like GPA. And they do it as a base. And then they add and subtract going up and down. Yeah, so definitely kind of look into it for the school that you want to apply to. Um, we had a question that said, what advice do you have for those of us that are interested in pursuing a surgical specialty? And um, yeah, that's all the questions. So make sure you want it. Um, so applications for surgery specialties are usually within your fourth and fifth year. So you should know by your by your, the end of your second year and probably by your third year. So if you know you want the specialty, you can do more research and do more rotations with those people so you can get letters. So it will make you more competitive for the fellowship. 
So I think as a first year, it's probably hard, but as a second year, if there's a specialty you really want, be adamant that you go on that rotation first or even do that rotation more than once so you know for sure that you want it. Because there are plenty of people who change. Um, kind of going off of that, there was people wondering, um, personally, what kind of characteristics do you think that someone who wants to go into surgery should have or should um, kind of work on improving themselves? Um, well, we, we like people who are efficient and reliable and who are willing to learn. Um, we hate people who like lie or say they did something but didn't, you know, you can't believe what they say. We just want somebody who's hardworking and honest and just to be a team player because surgery is all about playing as a team. And um, medicine is like a bigger department and surgery is much smaller of a department in the hospital. So we had to really work, work well together. You can't have too much drama because there's only so many residents. Yeah, and I kind of feel like that just goes into any specialty. You should try to be a good person overall. Yeah. Good person, work hard because we're, we're all colleagues. And, you know, if my resident is weak, then somebody else has to pick up the slack. So we just want somebody who can work well together. Yeah, that's really good advice. Kind of moving from that topic, um, there was a question about as a breast surgeon, do you do a lot of prolonged patient interactions? So do you see patients more than like once or twice or do they end up going to like, plastic surgery or different specialties once you're done with their case? So once I'm done with their case, I follow them for at least 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. In the first five years, I see them every six months. And then after five years, they can see me once a year. Okay. And do, do you feel like that um, constant interaction helps build your patient trust from other specialties? Yeah, I love it. I get to see them, um, ask them how their kids are doing, you know, ask them how retirement is. So um, in medicine, you see patients a lot more. So I don't want to see patients that much, but I like the, the amount that I get to see them. Like every three months or every six months or once a year, I think that's good. So I think it's a happy medium between seeing them too much and not seeing them at all. Yeah, that's great. Um, that sounds wonderful, actually. Um, so we did have someone um, kind of just ask about this more of your opinion. Um, if you see... Patients that come in a little too late um, when they have a, a serious complication just because they're sick or they're scared um, or, you know, because of financial burdens or insurance and stuff, just like a fear. Um, do you see that that often? And do you think there's a reason why particularly? Um, we see it with uh, a lot of the more urban populations. People are scared to go. There's a, there's a mistrust or um, people who try other medications that they think will help and it doesn't. So uh, the, the fungating breast mass, I saw a lot when I was in New York City in the underserved areas. Or sometimes there's patients who are in a different country who have these things and they can't get care there. They'll come here and then they'll come to the ER and then that's when we take care of them as well. But that's why it's important to have free clinics like we did in residency where we could take care of patients and make sure they get all their screening because no woman or man needs to die from breast cancer. We have great screening. Yeah, that's very true. So um, do you think your MPH kind of helps you kind of understand that a little bit more, just like the, the populations that, you know, will kind of come in a little bit later because of their fear and their mistrust? Yeah, absolutely. I think it does. Um, it helps me more um, if I want to plan screening or write protocols down just to, to be able to reach out to more people and make healthcare more accessible to the people who really need it. Yeah, that's great. great. That's awesome. Was, love to hear that. Everyone's very um, impressed by how much you really do in breast surgery and surgery in general. So thank you so much for sharing just kind of like little nuggets of advice and information. I hope you guys choose breast. <laughs> I, I, think have some, I think there's some breast surgery of converts in the chat who didn't even think about it before in our yeah, super future episode. colleagues. I'll see you at the conferences. <laughs> the Miami uh, breast conference every year. It's quite very nice. I go to the pool in the afternoon. <laughs> if you open up the chat, you can just see like all the thank yous pouring in. And oh, my pleasure. Oh wow, there's a lot. <laughs> and I think the last question that we have for you as we wrap up today is. What advice would you leave us pre-med students with today? I think you guys made a great decision. Just work hard, be an honest person, and you guys will do great. And I can't wait to work with all of you guys. 
Thank you so much. This was an amazing yeah. session. My pleasure. Good luck. Stay safe. Please, you, you can reach out to me if you want to message me. If you have any questions that you have on the side, I'd be happy to answer them. I have some free time because of COVID. Yeah, I'll go ahead and put your Instagram in the chat again for those who sure. want to go give you a follow. Okay. But we hope you have a great rest of your day. A happy Thank holiday you. season. Thank happy you. New Year. Yep. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.